right, here we go. <clears throat> Make sure we have, all right. What's going on? This is your man Terrence J, and welcome to a special edition of the last podcast. But we're gonna call this one the last podcast one on one. I have a special guest that's hanging out with me today. His name is Chase Harris. So Chase Harris, I got a chance to see Chase on social media, and I was looking at you know just his stories and his pictures, and you know a lot of times we see people on social media and. We have no idea where these people live at. And I so happened to see a picture of him at the game with his son. And I said, okay, they're at the Mavericks game. So that means they must be local. So I reached out to this young man and I'm so thankful that he said, yes, he would come in for this interview. And so he's here today in the studio. So welcome everybody. Chase Harris, how you doing, man? Good, man. Appreciate it. Say, man, I want to say thank you so much for coming in, um, taking the time out your day to have this conversation uh, with me. And I think that uh, one of the biggest things, man, is that, you know, I love promoting men. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of times um, a lot of people have platforms to promote, but I don't think men get an opportunity to get promoted as, you know, doing the job that God called them to do. Right. right? And so and I think that watching your page and watching everything that you, you know, have accomplished, the, the places you've been, places you've come from, it's something to be talked about. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very important to talk about these things. So um, but I'm gonna start off, man, just just give me kind of your little back your background as far as you know, where you're from? Are you originally from Texas? Or how did your story start out? Yeah, man. So I'm from a place called uh, Pampa, Texas. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when I tell people that, they think I'm from Tampa, Florida. Yeah. And I talk, I guess I talk a little different, so, mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of plays into it. But Pampa, Texas, small town, 17,000 people, uh, predominantly white. And so growing up, it was my mother and my biological father, um, probably until I was just about four years old. My biological father left, and so just me and my mom growing up, probably until I was middle school. So mm -hmm. during that time, he was in and out, my real dad. Um, he had an addiction to crack cocaine. Um, but at the end of the day, he was my father. He was my best friend. He was a man I looked up to. And from a mental standpoint, him and I, we won to one. Really? And that's the good, bad, and the ugly. And so in that, I was always able to get mentored by him, even though he was dealing with the demons that he mm -hmm. was dealing with. So um, that was kind of my early childhood. So I hung out with a lot of older cousins and things like that. So picked up some bad habits there too from them, <laughs> but the, I was accepted. Mm -hmm. um, all my family around me, um, gang members, drug dealers. Uh, it's crazy to think a small town like that, that is consumed That's what I was with all ask. that. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, it was, I witnessed murder at about seven years old. So a lot of trauma that I didn't realize mm -hmm. I was experiencing happened when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And so I think when I was in the, fourth grade my mom met another man his name was cliff and he became my stepfather later on in life um but even during that time uh there was altercation where my biological dad kidnapped me from the first grade took me to oklahoma i came back to barricades on the street because i mean they knew he had taken me and all that um and then when he found out that my mom and my stepdad were an idol i guess um he ran in my mom's job. He got a, what do they call it? Assault with a deadly weapon. Mm. Cause he cut a man's ear off with a knife. She worked at a barbecue mm -hmm. restaurant. Um, and almost beat my mom to death on the, oh, wow. on the concrete. So he went to jail for a while. Um, during that time, man, it was just, uh, really trying to understand at that age, like this is my queen. Mm -hmm. This is the one that I love the most, but I look up to you. Yeah. How are you hurting the one that I love the most? So you just battling all these things, went through counseling in elementary school, not really knowing why. Um, but then later on in life, uh, my stepdad was a lot more present in my mm -hmm. life. Solid man. Um, same thing came from no father. So he was just doing what he know, very stern, very strict. He called it constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. It was just criticism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm grateful for it as an adult. Yeah. But at the time, I really couldn't stand him. Yeah. And so... Uh, but he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot. He always provided for us. But early on, I think I was in the sixth grade. Sixth grade was the first time me and my friends decided we we're going to drink <laughs> before we went to a middle mm -hmm. school dance. And we drank. We got some Smirnoffs and stuff like yeah. that. Like y'all had the hot dollar stuff. Y'all didn't, didn't go to the to the to the low bottle. Predominantly white, so <laughs> <laughs> you could get that. But we threw it right in the trash can at my house. Yeah. So my mom came home, seen everything. 
She asked me, you been drinking? I said, no. I went in my room. Um, conviction just set over me like, oh, man, like a ton of bricks. Mm-hmm. Went back in there, told her, yes, I have been drinking. Got grounded. But say all that to say alcohol at an early age yeah. became what I did not know was going to be mm-hmm. my downfall. Mm-hmm. And so um, played football in, in high school, went to college for track, only went there one year. My girlfriend, my high school girlfriend broke up with me, so I was like, I got to get up out of here. Came up to Denton, went to school at UNT, um, joined a fraternity, but same thing, alcoholism just kind of continued. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I realized as an adult, what I was doing is I was, alcohol was my liquid courage. Okay. Even though I was the man when growing up, it was, I'm the man, but I'm still look past. Mm-hmm. My friend's still getting all the girls mm-hmm. that I want. You know what I mean? Like my friends still getting all the opportunities that I want. Mm-hmm. And so, but that alcohol, it allowed me to be just wild and free. Like I say what I want, do what I want. And you you think you are the man, but really it's people like, hey, let's make sure we don't call this food no yeah, more because yeah. he's wild and out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, man, that led to three DWIs by the time I was, let me see, this was 2013. What is it? So I'm, I think I was 23 years old. Okay. So 23 years old, um, I get DWI number three. Well, probably a month prior to that, um, I was coming home from work. I was a personal trainer at Anytime Fitness. And my dad called me. He was like, son, I got stage four cancer, my biological father. And just out of nowhere, he had a toothache. Then he thought he was swallowing the infection, and mm-hmm. that's why his stomach was hurting. But one of his friends was like, man, you don't look good. Took him to the hospital, and it was stage four cancer hmm. already. So um, that was something I was battling with. So once again, went back to the alcohol to kind of cope. And uh, I went to go see him one time, but then I was supposed to go see him. I got arrested on August 10th. Um, I was supposed to go see him August 11th. It was like a Sunday or a Saturday. And so driving home, went to a little restaurant, watched preseason Cowboys game. Driving home, my wife, she called. She was like, you don't sound too good. I was like, I'm going right up the street. And I think her saying that, I just kind of punched on the gas Mm -hmm. to speed up. I got pulled over for speeding, been drinking. So I went to jail for DWI number three, and that was on the 10th. I didn't get out of jail till the 12th. My father passed away on the 13th Hmm. of August. So that was something where, for me, I realized I had picked alcohol over my own father. And so for him, he didn't have a lot of people in his life because mm-hmm. of his past mm-hmm. drug abuse and all that. So he considered me his best friend. Okay. And so for years, I was like, man, how could the man that considered me his best friend, how could I just leave him high and dry mm-hmm. because I wanted to drink some alcohol? Mm-hmm. And so, man, that's kind of how it started. Um, from then, I was looking at 10 years. That, that's the sentence in prison. That's just a standard sentence. I had an attorney. He's like, I think you should take the two. You'll do about 14 months, and then you'll get out. I'm like, I'm not built for it, man. Mm-hmm. I'm not Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not going down yeah. like that. So I went. Um, it was a lady named Miss Teresa. I'll never forget. But she had just started this program called FAPE, which is the Felony Alcohol Intervention Program. Mm-hmm. It was only in Tarrant County. Mm-hmm. And luckily, I got convicted in Tarrant County. Yeah. So I went, told my story in front of her why I wanted to be in the program. I, I wanted to change my life. I didn't want to live like this. Um, and so she accepted me into the program. She accepted me, and a week later she got transferred to, I mean, out of state somewhere. But I was already in. Mm-hmm. So from that point, it was a four-year prison outside of prison. Okay. So I had an ankle monitor. I had to go to court every single week. I had to go to AA every single day. Mm-hmm. Christmas, Thanksgiving, um, had to go to these classes, um, all types of stuff. It was expensive, time consuming, but zero tolerance policy. Mm-hmm. So if you messed up, you went to prison seven years, no chance of parole. Mm-hmm. So you're going to do the whole bid. So during that time, I just learned a lot of time management. And so that was in, I got convicted October 22nd of 2013. Um, still worked as a trainer. At any time, fitness. 2016, I'm sitting on my porch. Um, or oh, mind you, let me go back. Got convicted October 22nd. The day before Thanksgiving, my wife and I found out we were 
pregnant, we were going to have our daughter. Mm -hmm. She was born the following year, 2014, August 5th. And so personal trainer, I started a clothing company, just a fitness clothing company. I was doing that. Um, and then 2016, I was sitting on the porch. I'd been hanging out with my daughter, but I worked long hours, 15, 16 hours as a trainer at mm -hmm. any time. I knew I wanted my time back. And so I felt like God told me it's time for you to move on. Like I got I got something more for you. Mm -hmm. I called my boss like, hey, I got I need to put in my two weeks, and uh, I'll never forget. He told me, okay, that's good. I was about to let you go anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> timing, man. Timing. I knew I knew it was my time to yeah, go. Yeah. And so from then I had secured a facility to open my own gym. Mm -hmm. um, went to my buddy's wedding in Florida. As soon as I arrived in Florida to go to the wedding, the landlord told me he gave my space away. So when I came back, I started a boot camp just outside mm -hmm. off my truck. Yeah. So I would string like resistance bands off my running boards on the side, battle ropes on the back. And so I just ran that for about six months and I found a new space, mm -hmm. built it from the ground up in 2016 is when we opened. And then I had to expand every six months from 2016 to 2020 to ultimately um, end up at a 5,000 square foot facility. Okay. And so... I did that, then I opened one in Dallas. So I had one in Fort Worth, one in Dallas that I was operating. Um, and then I got an opportunity to go to L.A., and I trained a music artist named Party Next Door. Okay. So that was in January 2020. Okay. I sold all my gyms, went out there for six months. Um, then COVID hit, so we weren't going on no tour. And at the same time, oh, I'm skipping, 2018, Yeah. my stepfather... He passed away of congested mm -hmm. heart failure um, in June. That April, I f we uh, had our son who was born with spina bifida. Okay, so let's, I, I want to go back a little bit, and now that we, we've got kind of the the base from the from the genesis until now, um, and I wanted to talk about with your dad, your mm -hmm. your, your biological father. Um, a lot of times, I don't think that. Uh, men get the opportunity to make mistakes and still be loved. Right. Right. Uh, where do you think that came from with you saying, I still look up to this man, even though he's doing things I don't like to my mom mm -hmm. and just kind of his overall life choices. Where, where did that, where did that come from? I think just his honesty. Like he never tried to deny anything that he had done. Um, he had this little saying, he'd be like, oh, son, I've been on that stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm going to catch you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So he was always up front with me. Okay. If, if he was actively in his addiction, mm -hmm. um, when he beat my mom, I mean, he apologized for it. So he always owned up to his own mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, he was the man who first ever took me to church. Mm -hmm. So the principles of grace and patience and forgiveness, I mean, he was the one who kind of led me to that path. Gotcha. And so it was almost like, the man who took me to learn all these things, how could I not use them mm -hmm. with him? Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's really what cultivated our relationship and kept it as strong as it was all the way until he died. Okay, yeah. And, and you know, I think that, you know, is is very important to highlight how you had that relationship with him even, you know, up mm -hmm. until his passing uh, because it kind of really goes to show your makeup as a man. Mm -hmm. You You are a man who who leads with love, right? you know? And so even when things weren't looking right and things were being, you know, things were being committed against your mother, who you love also, right. you're still able to see a, him through a vision of love and not conviction. Right. Yeah. So, and so, you know, like I said, and it's great to see that he's the one that took you to church first. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and the ironic part is if we were, you know, just uh, uh, creating a story and you started telling us, you know, bullet points, you would assume it would be mom, and it was like no, it was it was dad who yeah. was had a substance abuse problem. Uh, is the is the substance abuse problem something that goes through your family that that maybe took hold of you? I think I didn't realize at the time, but absolutely. Okay, absolutely. When I think of from my father, I got three sisters and one brother. Um, of us four, two of them have been to prison mm -hmm. um, for drug trafficking or. Um, uh, sexual abuse mm -hmm. in, my, in my brother, but my mom, nicotine, smoking cigarettes mm -hmm. forever. My sister smoked cigarettes forever. And then me, it was the alcohol. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. So, so it was something that was almost one of those things you call a generational curse that was yes. that was in the bloodline. Right. Uh, because there are studies that can show that if you have a uh, predispos- predisposition of possibly becoming an addict of something, yes. and a lot of times people think it's just alcohol or drugs sometimes it's just, it's gambling sometimes yep. it's crime you know people just get addicted to things right. and they have that personality so you you had that running through um but the thing is is that you said you still loved him even though so tell us a bit about mom mom uh she, she's a dog man she worked at the same place a barbecue restaurant she was a waitress mm-hmm. um and she worked there when she was pregnant with me she still worked there and then she ultimately became the manager and in a small town, basically she owned the joint, mm-hmm. as if they would call it. So if she wasn't there, things didn't run right. Um, and she took care of me and my sister just like that, mm-hmm. single family. As an adult, I realized that she was making, I think it was, she told me like $1,800 uh, a month, mm-hmm. I believe. I think it was $1,800 a month, something like that. It, it was less than mm-hmm. 30000 Yeah. I always had all the latest and greatest shoes, mm-hmm. clothes. We never went without food. We had everything. And so to know that, it's just, man, it's just so much more appreciation I have for her. Yeah. Because, I mean, she worked hard. Yeah. And she would come home, she worked the split shift. And, you know, as a kid, I wonder, like, man, you went to work, it's two, you don't go back to a five, but yeah. she's sleeping during that time. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, man, get up. Yeah, like, let's yeah, do something. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you understand now. Yeah. Um, she was just trying to provide. Yeah. And that generation, that's what they knew. Yeah. That was the that was the meat and potatoes of what they did. They protected, they provided, you know. So the love factor was shown, I think, through their acts of service. The, yes. So yes. It's a little bit different. Yeah, you know, and, and I think one of the things, uh been a father myself, um, and fortunately, I had a father who had conversations with me. Mm. Uh, and so I realized that my daughter was four years old. We were taking her to Disney at five. But I was working a lot to make sure I pay for Disney because mm-hmm. Disney is, is yeah, <laughs> expensive. Yeah. Um, she kept saying, well, Daddy, you have to go to work again? Mm-hmm. You're going back to work? You, have to, you know, because I'm picking up shift after shift. And so I realized, I can tell in her voice, she was questioning why I was leaving. Mm-hmm. And so we had to sit down at four years old. And this is amazing how much kids can pick up and we don't give them the credit. I said, baby, do you like your school that you go to? She said, yes. Do you like your swim class? Yes. Do you like your dance class, your piano class? Yes. I said, well, when I go to work, they give me money so I can pay for those things and so I can take you to Disney. She processed that four-year-old brain Mm -hmm. and she said, so you go to work, they give you money, and that's how you're going to take me to Disney? I said, yes. Oh, just like that. you need to go to work. Yeah. And, you know, and it turned from, you're going to work again to, right. daddy, you got to go back to work? And then when I would get home, she would say, did you make a lot of money so we can go to Disney? Mm-hmm. And I said, yes. And so I told her that story. I told her the reason why I was leaving because I didn't want this child of mine to be, right. you know, wondering. Does my dad not love me or does he not want to be here? Right. No, it's for a reason. And so, like you said, a lot of times back in our generation, the parents just did. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times, so mom was out saying, listen, I know one way to make sure these kids get what they need. Absolutely. And that's to go to work. So mm-hmm. I'm going to work, sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep. And as a child, you're like, yeah, can you get up, mom? And right, she's right. like, if I don't get up, you don't eat. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes we got to have those conversations with the kids to be very, very honest with them. Like, I appreciate the way your dad did. Mm -hmm. Very honest. This is how this works. I wish it was different. Right. And if I had another way, I would. Yeah. But this is the only way I got right now until I figure out something else. And so now with that, that, that process of dealing with your dad, uh, you said that, you know, he took you to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Was that, was that him? Uh, wanting to uh, get at your mom, or do you think that was him saying I, I, he wanted you with him? Yeah, I think it was a way to get at my mom. Okay, like, okay. I mean, he told me my entire life, like, your mom is the love of my life. Mm-hmm. I'll love her forever. Um, I, I, I'll give you this little piece. When he was dying on his deathbed, he was hanging on, hanging on, hanging on. My mom is a God thing. My mom went to go see him um, and basically just – I think it was just closure for mm-hmm. everybody. Mm-hmm. And 
they said, my uncle was telling me that when my mom came and he heard her voice that he was unconscious, but tears just ran down the side of his face. Mm-hmm. And then that night he passed away. Okay. okay. So it was almost like that a man that yes. he needed to know that he had made and then he was able to go. So um, absolutely. And then I guess he had a friend out there and we went there. We hung. I remember we hung out at this house with these kids I did not know mm-hmm. playing video games. He was on the phone a lot. And then I think his friend told him, like, basically, like, what you doing right now? Like, you got to take him back mm-hmm. home. He wants to. Go. Like, I remember crying in the car saying, I want to go back home. Mm-hmm. I don't want to come here. And I think just as the time went on, as the night passed, he brought me back. Knowing he was going to jail. Yeah. As soon as he crossed that line, he was going to jail. Yeah. But, I mean, he brought me home. How, how, how do you think um, – how you process their relationships, uh, and I know you're married now, how do you think how you process their relationships affect you in your relationship today? Mm. I think for me, like I hold a lot of the same emotions that he holds Mm -hmm. um, in the sense of I I can get caught up on you got your role, I got my role. Mm -hmm. Instead of us being 100, 100 serving Mm -hmm. each other, Mm -hmm. it can be if I'm going to work, if I'm taking the kids to the sports, if I'm doing this, should no cup be on this table when mm-hmm. I get home? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Just, yeah. just ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I can get caught up in that, and that's of him. That's yeah. the good, bad, and yeah. the ugly that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. It's this um, it's this ego, I guess you will, mm-hmm. of I'm the man, I'm doing everything to provide, mm-hmm. um, protect. Yeah. You need you need to tighten it up. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. so those are the things I work on daily. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I, I pick a word every single year for myself, and it started a few years ago, and it was um, um, stewardship. I wanted to get mm-hmm. better with my money, mm-hmm. so it was stewardship. Then last year it was obedience, okay. and this year it's gentle okay. because that, that's the piece that I lack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I did, I did, yeah. I'm hard on them yeah. sometimes, so <laughs> I got to cool out a yeah. little bit. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and the reason the reason I think it's important to hear your your, your story of, of the upbringing is, is because we can really look at your dad loved hard. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, you know, he was willing to say, hey, no matter what, uh, uh, you know, I love your mom, mm-hmm. and this is love of my life. And, and even, even going through his battles – he still found a way to be a father to you as right. best as he could, right? And your mom, she was like, hey, head down, get the job done. Mm-hmm. So those things get downloaded into us that right. we don't even know, and we have to, we do have to process those to figure out. Mm-hmm. And so so now as you are, like, and that's why I asked about how, did, how you process, how you view them, because we're not in our parents' relationship. Right. We see them from a different lens, but we do have our own processes, and we do carry those. Um, and so now you guys are, um, you know, making it through your your journey as a as a husband and wife. And you know, so that time you said that you had to go through that program. Mm-hmm. So you guys were married during that time. Mm-hmm. How did that affect the relationship? <sighs> I mean, I think my wife extremely supportive, mm-hmm. but I think internally she was kind of upset because, I mean, because of my mistakes, mm-hmm. it stole her day. Mm-hmm. We planned on going on a destination wedding. We had all this stuff planned for her. Mm-hmm. When I got arrested, I couldn't leave the, the city mm-hmm. or the county. Mm-hmm. And so all that stuff was just on wraps. We had to get married at the Justice of the Peace. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think a lot of her, I mean, a girl's lifelong dreams yeah. of getting married, having... Her dad, her grandfather, whoever it's going to be, walk her down the aisle. I pretty much took all that from her okay. because of my mistakes. Um, but, I mean, she held me down in yeah. the process. She lost her mom in high school, which was her best friend. Mm-hmm. And so she was able to walk me through kind of some of the – just the trauma and just the things that you struggle with if you lose a parent you feel like you didn't do mm-hmm. everything you could to – be the best child, ignore their phone calls, mm-hmm. whatever. So she was able to kind of be with me through that time. Also, be my support system as I couldn't drive for a whole year. She pregnant, driving me to work at 5 a.m. in the morning while holding a kid on her shoulder. Mm-hmm. Like it, I mean, yeah, she, she held me down the whole time. Man, that, that's beautiful. And, and do you uh, do you feel sometimes like there's a, a debt to repay during that time? Do you feel even today? Um, I think so. Um, I, I remember – like I'm deep. Like we talked yeah, about my parents. Yeah. I remember it was twenty. I think it was twenty fifteen, maybe twenty sixteen. Broke. I couldn't. It was her birthday. It was mm-hmm. Christmas. It was like oh, I can't get you nothing. I can't get you nothing. 
And I think it was 2015, I wrote her an email. That was her Christmas present. And I told her, you will never have to go without a day in your life. And like talking about that will make me emotional mm -hmm. um, because I did it. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, that's the piece that gives me the most fulfillment mm -hmm. is I was able to stand on my word mm -hmm. and give her what I told her I would give her. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, as as men, I keep highlighting that, you know, we, we are as good as our word. Mm -hmm. And for you to say, I'm going to – all I can give you right now is my word. Right. And then to fulfill that, I mean, that's one of the greatest fulfilling uh, feelings for, for a man to say, I told you what I was going to mm -hmm. do and I did it and I get a chance to watch you enjoy. Right. Because there were things that I'd done that took away your joy. Right. So if I can give that back, you know, that's that's my greatest repayment. Um, and so now you guys are married. Now you have... You have your business that's, that's flourishing. Mm -hmm. You said you opened up your, your, your gyms and you mm -hmm. wanted to go to Florida, mm -hmm. but you didn't. And, and, and tell me a little bit, of how do you process the no? Because a lot of times when we pray, I, 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 I say this all the time, mm -hmm. we're not ready for the no. Right, right. We believe, I'm going to say, God, give me this. He's going to say yes. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's no's or protection. How did you feel about that no when you were ready to go to Florida to start? Because... I'm assuming, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you moving to Florida was a brand new start. It was getting out of Texas. It was moving to mm -hmm. another area, and now all of a sudden you have to stop that and stay here. How did that How did that feel to you? So Florida is kind of like it's, a, it's another wife thing. It's her lifelong dream to live in Florida. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I can make that happen for mm -hmm. you. But our son, we have an insurance that covers him until he's 18 years old, and we don't got to pay a dime out of pocket. Mm -hmm. You go to Florida... The healthcare is not as good, and you lose that. So okay. you have to restart, get on the list, which is a two-year list. Mm -hmm. um, so then at that point, it's, it's a compromise. Mm -hmm. of, we can still get a house in Florida. We just can't be full-time residents in okay. Florida. Okay. And so that's just kind of – it was almost an easy decision okay. because we can still do it. Mm -hmm. We just can't do it at the capacity that we desire. Okay. And my wife, she was okay with that, so, I mean – it, okay. wasn't, it wasn't too big of a oh, deal. Okay, okay. And so, and I know, you know, one of the things that, that you, you highlight outside of your fitness and, and things like that is your family and with your son. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, one of the pictures that I did see, you know, is you and your son at the Mavericks game. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Cash, correct? Yes. Cash was born with spinal bifida? Yep. So explain us what spinal bifida is. So spinal bifida is basically a neurological disorder which occurs because the spinal canal doesn't develop all the way. So... Mm -hmm. Our spinal cord is closed, or our um, spine is closed, and our spinal cord runs in the middle. Mm -hmm. His is filleted wide open. Okay. And so during the birthing process of him just growing in the womb, all the fluid is touching his spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And so the damage that is created is, is lifelong. It's okay. done. And so for him, it's L4, L5, which dictates, like, your bowel control, mm -hmm. um, your lower extremity movement. So that's why a lot of times you'll see us, like, using the braces to try to stand and mm -hmm. walk because he doesn't have that natural function. We have to cast him for him to go pee. We have to do essentially um, an enema type system mm -hmm. for him to go poop. So mm -hmm. there's just so much stuff that comes along with just the placement of his diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, but his spirit is bigger than all that. So, yeah, I mean, we deal with, it's our normal. Mm -hmm. So we deal with what we got to deal with, but I mean, Ultimately, we don't know no difference. So it's like, it is what it is. Even though yeah. my daughter didn't have any of that stuff, mm -hmm. it, I, you probably understand this. When you become a parent, you just know what to do yeah. when the baby gets here. Yeah, and yeah. so it's the same thing, even though he does have disabilities. Okay, and so, you know, and been able, what, what was your um, mindset? Because I, I know uh, everybody makes their own choices when it comes to social media and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the thinking behind uh, making sure that you highlight his story online? Um, I mean, that's a big part of our life. Okay. Um, and it was really by accident. Uh, I had a, a fitness page on TikTok, and I was sharing my fitness recipes, stuff like that. And it was, I think I had like 10,000 followers. Mm -hmm. And then I just posted a video that was funny to me and my wife of because of his create or his imagination mm -hmm. telling the nurse that he twisted his ankle because all he was doing is shooting a baby white in the toilet and he missed. Mm -hmm. And so his story was, ah, I twisted my ankle. That's why I missed. <laughs> yeah. 
my wife and I know him, boy, you're in a wheelchair. Yeah. You ain't standing yeah. doing nothing. Yeah. And so it was funny, and I posted that video, and it went ultra viral. And then mm-hmm. even though I had posted so many stories and posts about him before that just didn't catch, mm-hmm. that one caught. Mm-hmm. And now all eyes were on Bubba. We didn't, his name is Cash. Yeah. We don't want to get it to the internet because it, it's crazy yeah. out there. Yeah. So he's Bubba yeah. on the internet. And so, I mean, now, I mean, he just captivates lives because he's resilient. He, wow. he will try anything. He will do anything because he wants that independence. He'll tell you he wants to go to the NBA. Mm-hmm. Whether it's the NBA or it's the Paralympics, he wants to be the greatest basketball player to ever live. Mm-hmm. And so he does everything necessary to try to make that happen, even at five years old. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what, man? I think I think one of the things that you can see is the vibrance and the energy of him. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's the beauty of Ben. Of they say sometimes having a child like mine, mm-hmm. it's like I only see obstacle and how I can accomplish obstacles. Right. You know, where a lot of times as adults we see obstacles and we see what I can't do, mm-hmm. what I where I can't go, where. I, but he's like, no, let's figure this out you can you can see that energy right, right. How, how does he how does he help the family with his energy to help you guys mindset um it man it, it's tough to say mm-hmm. uh, because he is so like he's just so courageous he mm-hmm. will do anything as you can imagine mom and sis like they're on the edge of their seat mm-hmm. because they don't know what's gonna is he gonna fall yeah. is he gonna fail like but it, it's only winning up here for yeah. him yeah so he's like, man, I may fall or I may fail once, and I might get scared, mm-hmm. I'm a, but I'm going to try it. Yeah. Him and I have a trust in one another that I'm not going to let you get injured. I'm not going to let anything happen to you, but I need you to give it your all. Mm-hmm. And he's willing to do that for me. And so that that's a catch-22 because we just had a conversation, like you said, we talked earlier about your four-year-old. Mm-hmm. I had to have that conversation with him that, I don't. If you never walk a day in your life, if you never stand, if you never make a basketball, I'm gonna always love you mm-hmm. because you're my son. And so for him, he can think that his accomplishments, his accomplishments, is how he gains my love. Mm-hmm. Just because I think just because we're, we're on camera, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so those are genuine reactions that you get because we've never done that mm-hmm. before. But I think for him, he can't distinguish between. You're super excited now. You're super excited then, but yeah, I guess because he can rewatch it. Yeah, that it, it seems more. He yeah. knows that there's millions of people have liked yeah. it, whatever, whatever. And so we had to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. This the day you say you don't want to make another video. This channel goes away. It's, it's done because this is for you. This yeah. is not for me. Yeah, and so it's tough because mm-hmm. you got to have those conversations, and his life is hard. Mm-hmm. You don't see it because he lives with such a positive spirit, but. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I could do it. Wow. Um, did you guys know that this was a possibility before he was actually born? No. Well, we found out at 20 weeks, but we had no idea. My wife carries a gene called like um, MTFR. I know I'm saying it wrong. Mm-hmm. But basically what it means is when you take these prenatal vitamins, um, folic acid, her body doesn't produce folic acid. Mm. And so, or can't break down folic acid either. Folic acid is what kind of prevents the spina bifida Mm -hmm. symptom from occurring. And so because she carries this gene, she is more susceptible to having a child with spina bifida. Mm. And, you know, you're just not knowing. We had our daughter, no issue, so you don't... It's kind of of one of those things as a random type situation. But there is a gene that that shows the probability of a possibility, I should say. Mm -hmm. But we didn't test for that until after. Mm. And, you know, and, and... I'm I'm so glad you brought that up because I I just found out that for people who carry the sickle cell gene mm-hmm. or sickle cell trait, uh, they have it whenever they procreate with someone, they have a one in four chance of creating a child with sickle cell. Oh, wow. And so uh, for those of you who remember uh, the Apollo, Showtime at Apollo, um, I learned this from Miss Kiki Shepard, mm-hmm. um, and she is she's a big advocate of this. And it was just one of those things where her big thing is, hey, make sure you go get tested. Right. And I don't, I don't think that a lot of times in life we even uh, think about having tests done for ourselves to give to our spouses right. or to for us to know. And so uh, I think this just goes more to the to the procedure of a lot of us have you know health insurance. Mm-hmm. 
go out and ask for all these type of tests. Yeah. You know, realize what it is because we can carry genes and carry traits right. that can help us uh, either do something to prevent it or help us just get an understanding and awareness. Um, so now, so so this happens. You know, he's born. He he's he's uh, he's here, and, and we you figure out he has a spinal bifida. Um, is it is this something that is? Um, What's the commonality with, with, with a child having this? Is it? Mm, I mean, what what the doctors would tell you is they're going to have low quality of life. Okay. So he is an anomaly. Okay. Based on a doctor. Okay. Um, look, he he did have with spinal bifida. You can have other type of mm-hmm. disorders. So he had what's called Chiari mm-hmm. mal- malformation, um, symptomatic two or something like mm-hmm. that. Basically, what that means is he had bilateral vocal cord paralysis. So both of his vocal cords were paralyzed. Mm-hmm. Um, so he aspirated everything that he consumed. He couldn't breathe. His airway was the like the width of a piece of notebook paper. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a feeding tube because obviously he's aspirating everything into his lungs. So he had a feeding tube placed. He had a trach placed. Um, he has a VP shunt because the brain fluid doesn't just naturally flow down to mm-hmm. your stomach, builds up in your head. So you have to put a device so that it'll drain. So even to this day, he has a tube. It runs behind his neck mm-hmm. and into his stomach. He will have that for the rest of his life. Okay. Um, because his he was a big baby, mm-hmm. his skin was so tight, he had to have, I think, three different um, closure procedures. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, they had to bring a plastic surgeon in. They took a skin graft from his hip to close up his back. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it was pretty intense. Okay. Um, but I mean, with all that, yeah, he progressed. And you know, I left this piece out, and this is the really this is the glory to God that gives me confidence that everything will always work out. Um, before having him, my wife and I we weren't on the best terms mm-hmm. in our marriage, sleeping in different rooms. Um, and I'm in my room and where I sleep, and I God called me like, you need to be fruitful. What you're doing right now is selfish. You need to be fruitful, and you. Know, multiply and so i went in my wife's room i told her hey god told me we got to have a baby and in obedience we had a baby i mean we got pregnant 20 months later or 20 weeks later Mm -hmm. we found it was gonna have spina bifida and so in that it was i mean it's a test of faith it was you you told you called me to do something i was obedient and then this is what you're gonna give me and then now here i look five almost six years later and the impact that he has had on this mm-hmm. world, yeah, only God could see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so but, that's the piece but, that a lot of people don't know. Yeah, but but you said something. This is what you're going to give me. Mm-hmm. What was that feeling that in that conversation you had with God to say, "Hey, um, I'm doing what you want me to right. do." What was there? Were you upset? Yes, you, absolutely. Because okay. I mean, he was in Medical City, Dallas. So mm-hmm. every day we're driving from Keller to Medical City. Mm-hmm. And so on them drives, you would go and you get bad news. Come mm-hmm. home, process, go back, you get more bad news. Mm-hmm. So I think during the first six weeks of his life, he had about 12, 13 surgeries. Mm-hmm. He was essentially having surgery every other day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you just, like, you pissed off. Mm-hmm. You're like, why would you, like, in your mind, you like, I should have listened to those doctors mm-hmm. and I should have aborted it. Because there's no reason this little baby should have to go through all this mm-hmm. stuff, yeah, for you, yeah. And so, yeah, it was a time. It was, I mean, it was a trialing time. I mean, we switched churches during that time mm-hmm. just because, you know, so much stuff was going on we yeah. didn't understand. Yeah. And so, I mean, but it was just him growing my faith. But he, but he told you, this is what you should do. You did it, and then you look and see what a lot of times we see as bad from mm-hmm. the peripheral it has created so much good correct and so you're watching and you know and the great thing is we live in a time of of social media yes because now this story can be given to the masses and people can latch on and and give whether they uh any type of support they want to give and also you guys are probably giving so much support to other people correct. just by watching because i'm pretty sure there are other people going through this that it, that the light is dim yep. uh they're not understanding which mm-hmm. way to go and feeling like they can't go on and you're like yeah you can so i'm right. pretty sure you guys have those conversations with other people absolutely and i mean we get people in the dms like grown men 
man, like a guy stopped me in the mall. Like, man, I don't even want to get up and go to work sometimes, but I watch y'all's videos and I see if Bubba can do it, I can do it. And so the fact that this, I mean, he's a baby to me. Yeah, yeah. This baby yeah. can inspire yeah. even grown men. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, man, is that um, watching what obedience yes. does, you know, and they say obedience is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And so you were able to be obedient to what you heard. And fortunate enough, and I think this is where, uh, as we're talking about you as the man um, and a husband, you had a partner who said, okay, if that's what God said, sleeping in separate bedrooms, mm -hmm. if this is what God said, this is what we'll do. Mm -hmm. And then you did it, and then you go from that. And I think, I think a lot of times we go back, I'm always – you know, employing people to watch your own movie. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we, we spend so much time being the main character in our movie, we don't go back and watch the way that our life has played out. Right. And I think when you go back and say, man, just imagine, you know, because we all have free will, just imagine if you didn't go through and tell your wife what God told you. Right. Just imagine if a wife said, I'm not doing that, he didn't tell me, you know, right, and right. all these different things that you could have taken these different turns to look at the beauty, you know, look at your whole family as a whole. Right. And speaking of, and, and I, I definitely want to, don't want to do this because I am a girl dad, man. Yeah, yeah. Speak, being a girl dad, what does that mean to you as, as a father? Because we know those little girls have our heart. Yeah, man. And that, to be honest with you, being a good girl dad is more important, and this is going to sound crazy, than ensuring that my son can walk one day. Mm -hmm. He's going to be fine whether mm -hmm. he's able-bodied or mm -hmm. he's in a wheelchair. But I am dictating the quality of man that she is going to mm -hmm. seek when she becomes a woman. Yeah. And, you know, I get a lot of flack on social media just because him and I are the social mm -hmm. media people. Mm -hmm. My wife and my daughter are not, but yeah. it's always, oh, I feel sorry for that girl. I feel, yeah. Yeah. Well, where's the, the daughter? She doesn't get any attention. And these are the same conversations I have yeah. with her to ensure yeah. that that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. But it's a situation where that's my princess. Mm -hmm. And everything, I do everything in my power to ensure she knows that she's loved, she's beautiful, mm -hmm. she's enough. And so that's what I focus on. And a lot of those things you don't put on social media because those are very intimate true, moments. True, true. And these are, she's a little lady and she's growing into a woman. Mm -hmm. She don't always want her business in the street like yeah, a little boy. Yeah, so yeah. it's just different. It's but different, yeah. It's just as um, intentional uh -huh. as it is with my son. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 the thing is, we had a lot of conversation before we started, but we didn't talk about that. And and because of I know that you have two, two children, mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to make sure that you got a chance to highlight that because I do understand how important right, that right. is. Um, you know that that man in that that girl's life is is so important right. because again she's going to follow your lead. Correct. And I think that's why understanding your transition from your childhood going through the the uh, uh, you know sentence with saying okay listen I got a couple of DWIs I have to do you know house arrest you know essentially ankle monitor uh, not being able to do a lot of this stuff to husband, father, career man, uh, entrepreneur, things like that, showing that transition because I think a lot of times people get people give up on other people too fast. Mm -hmm. And I think there were a couple times in your life where somebody could have said, I'm done with him. Mm -hmm. And you look and, and see, starting with your wife, she never said that. Even though you guys, everybody that's married go mm -hmm. through something. And now look at it now. Right. But if you go back, that little boy never gave up on his dad. Right. You were you were still there saying, Hey, that's my father, and I'm going to I'm going to love him because of who I see him as. Right. And I think that that just goes back to see there's some 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 threads that are that are tied from your childhood up to now, being able to say, These are what this is what I learned and some stuff. I had to unlearn, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. but now here we are doing this. Um, so now the thing is, is that you guys are, are growing your 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 social media page just by doing what you do, doing what you do. Yeah, you know, you you guys you are able to blend out. I think a lot of times people wonder uh, how do you blend the public side 
with the private side? How do you do that? Because mm-hmm. I think that's a fear for a lot of people who want to use this platform we have called right, social right. media. How do I how do I do both? So how do you guys navigate that? I mean, it's just transparency. So I think our our content is so infectious because it's just transparency, mm-hmm. genuine. There's mm-hmm. none of the stuff we do a stage. Mm-hmm. It's a hey, bubble, man. And it, I have comments that bubble, they, they tripping, man. Mm-hmm. They ain't trying to give us no love because you're so great. Mm-hmm. You do everything that's unthinkable, so we got to go to the next mm-hmm. level. So we'll just look around the house like, man, hey, you think you can get up there? I don't know. You want to try? Yeah. And so we'll, mm-hmm. I'll put the camera on and we'll try. So yeah. the video of him falling off the changing mm-hmm. table, that's just like, hey, you think you can get in your wheelchair from up here? I'll catch you if you fall. Yeah. And it, it just went like, I mean, that's just how it yeah. goes. And so, like I said, there's there's certain moments because the camera is on so much where we just take a break. We're like, we're not doing this. Mm-hmm. We go family dinner every Thursday night. There's no camera on during family mm-hmm. dinner. It's just us enjoying each other's time, mm-hmm. our company. Um, if we're going to go out to the mall or something, if it's like um, we're trying to bring awareness to ramps and mm-hmm. different ways that wheelchair users could get around the mall. And yeah, we'll do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, just informative type stuff. But there's a lot of stuff about our lives that people don't see. And that's what works for us. And, and how many times is your son saying, Hey, film this. It, it, mm-hmm. the, the, is, is he the one sometimes that's spurring it yeah, on? Yeah. <laughs> See, Him, yeah. Even my daughter, like, Hey dad, you think we could make yeah. a video? I'm like, I mean, if you, I don't really want to. I don't can. want to, but I mean, yeah. you know, and I, I think, I think hearing that for a lot of people who are watching is that it, a lot of times, you know, people think it's the parents that are doing it. Right. No, listen, your daughter who is not even pretty much the main character in these videos right. is like, hey, I think this would be a good video. Yeah. You know, and so it becomes this whole family thing where it's a family unity right. and bonding situation. Um, and so now, you, I know you did, you know, you started out doing personal training, but you also uh, now are in competitions and things mm-hmm. like that and professional. Uh, is it is it is it considered bodybuilding or yes. like, okay, so consider a professional bodybuilder. Um, how has any part of your journey helped you because that's a different being a professional bodybuilder is a different level of discipline right versus i go to the gym and i look good right right but when you go to competition how is any part of your or is there one part of your life that you see that you are able to use to do that type of discipline to be able to be in competitions absolutely and it all goes back to fatherhood i understand that by me doing bodybuilding it requires three things for me and that's discipline, hard work, and consistency. These are three factors that I can physically show my children, this is what is necessary mm-hmm. to be that greatest basketball mm-hmm. player that ever lived, mm-hmm. to be the best cheerleader or track star that you want to be for my daughter. So I get to live it every single day. Mm-hmm. I don't want to. Mm-hmm. I want to go eat ice cream yeah. with them. Yeah. I want to go eat snow cones and have pazookies when yeah. we go to dinner. They understand, oh, dad's on prep. So mm-hmm. they'll say, Dad, when you get off prep, let's go over here. Mm -hmm. Dad, when you get off prep, let's go over here. Mm -hmm. But they see me stand on that stage and win. Mm -hmm. So they can put two and two together. If I do this and this, I can get up there and get medals and stuff like that. And so that's that's the only reason I do it. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) I don't like it. Just it keeps me structured. Mm -hmm. But more so than anything, it allows me to teach additional lessons to my children got you got you so it, it, it's all working for the greater good mm-hmm. of the family whole yeah and he's like look i want that ice cream too I- man bad <laughs> bad yeah man so so what what would be your as you get ready to close out um what would be your take on just manhood in general and what i mean by that is uh the responsibilities of a man when it comes to fatherhood marriage and just to yourself mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing man, is you can get caught up in culture and forget the biblical sense of what a man, husband, and father are called to be. Mm-hmm. And when you get up in culture, you can justify to yourself how things are okay that aren't okay. And that means putting our pride and ego at the forefront of every decision mm-hmm. and reaction that we have. Whereas I, I fail at it every day, but I attempt to love my wife as God loved the church. And that can be tenfold. That can be for my children. That can be for any relationship Mm -hmm. that I have. And so for me, just striving to do that every single day helps me get better each and every day because now I'm living based on a principle that I believe in 
and that I know holds true mm -hmm. because I've seen the 50 year old marriages. I've seen the 60 year anniversaries. My wife's um, grandparents were going to do their 75th anniversary wedding anniversary in June. Um, so I've seen what tenure in marriage looks mm -hmm. like and it all starts with serving your partner mm -hmm. the best way that you possibly can. And if you serve your partner the best way that you possibly can, your children are going to know what to expect when they get to those roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that sums it up good, man. And I think that um, the more message that we can put out here, especially as we look around the landscape today mm -hmm. and understand what manhood means, right? you know, and, and I think that's, that's, that's a tremendous thing, man. So, listen, Chase, I appreciate you taking yeah, the time man. out, Thank man, you. to come through and hang out with us. You guys, make sure that you continue to follow us on social media. Uh, on Facebook, it is The Last Podcast 1, and on Instagram, it's underscore The Last Podcast. Uh, but I want to make sure uh, they know how to follow you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, our biggest platform is TikTok, and that's Chase underscore Cashman um, on, on Instagram. Uh, my son's Instagram is Bubba underscore Cashman 13 and mine is Chase Harris fit underscore. Okay. All right. So make sure you guys go out and follow them. Go out and check out the stories. I promise you um, it, it's a, it's a good showing of how family unit and structure operates. And so we get a chance now with technology to get a chance to watch it and see it in real time and see all the greatness uh, that Chase actually provides as a man and a husband and a, a structure for his family. And also you get a chance to be entertained by the adventures of Cash Man and just <laughs> watching him uh, do his thing and, and live life to the fullest. And I hope that you guys take this message to understand you need to live life to your fullest. Remember, there's only wins up here. Don't let the losses infiltrate your brain. We'll see you guys next time right here on The Last Podcast.